I don't know, guys, but it's starting to feel like late 90s stock market fever, kind of a play on that Nirvana song from the 90s. Um, and, you know, the one stat Bob you sent to me that just blew my mind is Microsoft now is worth $3.1 trillion. And if you compare that to the entire energy sector, the S&P 500, it's worth literally double. And if you look at the free cash flow on Microsoft, it's something like $67 billion versus the entire energy sector is free cash flow $135 billion. I don't know about you. I'd rather own the entire energy sector as opposed to one tech stock. That's wild. Well, I know, first of all, that I'm going to heat my homes and cool my homes, and I'm going to drive my cars. You know, I'm going to be using Copilot. You know, Chris, you say Copilot's pretty good with Microsoft, but um, I don't see where there's that, you know, that need to have to use Copilot every day where I certainly want to be able to get around in my car while I'm down here in Naples. I don't know, Dad. Rumor has it Copilot's been right in your market commentary. <laughs> I wish. I wish. There's no way any there's no way any artificial intelligence could be as pithy as I am with my market commentary, guys. Come on. Don't insult me. Well, I mean, the reality of it is I think AI is gonna change everything, but it's like anything else. You know, it's the expectations initially for any sort of new technology are always way too high. Um, and I think you're starting to see a lot of that hype right now. It's like you can't turn on the TV or the financial news where they're not talking about artificial intelligence uh, in one way or the other. And you get to a point where it's like, okay, we get it. We get that it's important. But to your point, Bob, it's kind of important to drive my car. <laughs> it's kind of important to, to heat my home. I don't know. You know, I'm a basic man, so I get that. Well, you have, you know, record earnings. We have a GDP number that's been increased. We have the... Um... Earnings season was phenomenal, right? About 80% of the companies beat their earnings estimates. Uh, Federal Reserve is, you know, being pretty transparent. And, Rai, your old buddy from Merrill Lynch comes out the other day, David Rosenberg, and says, clearly a recession is underway. Now, how many years in a row has David Rosenberg been telling us that we're clearly in a recession? I think it's been like the whole 2000s, basically. <laughs> so uh, it's been a long time. And, yeah, no, I think at this point, like and most economists, They've gotten over the fact that, okay, you know, we weren't right last year. If you look at GDP growth, you know, growth in the U.S. economy in the first quarter, it's already projecting to be pretty good, close to 3%. Um, we saw some stubborn inflation data this week, but okay, instead of coming in 0.3%, it came in at 0.4%. That's hardly a huge spike in inflation through January. If you look at the last three months or so, I mean, we're pretty close to what the Fed's target is, especially when you take those shelter costs out. So, I mean, at the end of the day, inflation is still moderating you if we see a little spike here with the data this past week. That's true, guys. But I saw a great quote the other day is that investors don't invest for bull markets. They chase bull markets. Um, and I don't know if you noticed uh, during the Super Bowl, but uh, one of the Kelsey brothers, you know, bumped into Coach Reed, you know, a little rudely, actually. It was pretty bad look for him. <laughs> But I found out yesterday he wasn't complaining about the fumble and not being in the game. He said, Coach, why did you tell me to sell my NVIDIA at 300? <laughs> <laughs> and now it's over 700 and getting yeah. higher. I, I, don't, I don't really need to turn the news on or the TV on. You know, we've got the, the, the greatest group of people in the world that can tell us exactly what's going on or what's being chased in the market, and that's our clients. And I tell you, every phone call that I've had over the past three weeks has been about you know buying more Nvidia stock or getting in this AI thing. I don't know what it is, sure. but we should be invested in it. Yeah. Well, and also it's the human condition, right? I mean, last year, talk about how the pendulum swings. Yeah. It was so hard to keep people in the market because they believed that we we're going to go off a cliff, <laughs> whether it was a bear market, whether it was going to be a recession in the economy, and no one was really happy that we were invested in the stock market. Now it's like, wait a second, why don't I have more tech? Why don't I have more growth in my portfolio? Yeah. So you're constantly going from fear to greed. And I would argue, you know, we kind of went from this, I wrote this this past week, but crossing that Rubicon of rational enthusiasm, like everyone's feeling a little bit better to now we're kind of getting closer to what we like to call irrational exuberance. If we learn from history, it can only get worse from here. No, it can only get worse because you've got, oh my gosh, so you, got, you got scarcity, which is jealousy. Um, you get that green eyed look when you're sitting there with your wonderful 5.3% T-bill. Thinking, you know, what am I missing? That's well, a fear of missing out. And that's when you see companies like NVIDIA suddenly become worth more on a capitalization basis than the entire Chinese stock market. Now, look, uh, for the first time ever, we imported more goods from Mexico than China. I just read the other day, guys, which is 
you know, that's 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 a major change. But China's still got 1.3 billion people that, um, you know, are a lot of middle class. So, you know, that recession will end. That real estate bubbles burst. And so it's just um, it's just a world of opportunities right now. Right. And, and how do you handle uncertainty? You diversify the living daylights out of your portfolio to, to overcome uncertainty. Wait, are you sure the answer is not by NVIDIA stock? Yeah. Just to be well, sure. That was last month. I, you guys didn't tune in. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, and that's the problem is, right? We know most investors aren't going to make the right decision here. Um, and we still have, we look at this number all the time, but between money market funds and what we call money market equivalents, you still have $7 trillion sitting in basic like cash accounts. getting, And they are getting you know, great yields right now. You're getting close to 5%. But you know, I suspect here it's, a, yeah. it's an election year. Fed's probably going to cut interest rates, maybe not the four or five times that everyone thought they were going to cut, but maybe even two times. Those rates are going to start to go lower. Money's going to funnel in somewhere. And we know when you blindly buy the S&P 500, which five stocks make up 25% of that index right now, it's going into all those hot names, uh, basically blindly. So you could see a lot more of that, but you just don't know when the party's going to stop. And that's the problem with that trade. Well, I think there's a lot of problems with that, right? Now, first of all, you're dealing with you know, if you're an investor and you're successful and you're my age, you have a lot of money. If you're your age, you're accumulating a lot of money. And you just got, I always call it the, the every dollar strategy, right? It's like, well, you know, I have all my money at NVIDIA. Every dollar? You know, it's like, is that, do you want every one of your dollars invested in one thing? So, you know, you really want to truly diversify um, your strategy because it, it over time, you know, you'll find that, you know, it's what you don't believe it is what actually makes you the most money. You know, over our lifetime, small cap value has been the best performer. You know how many accounts we review every week, new potential accounts? They don't have a dime in small cap value, right? Like, why would I want to own that? Well, because it's cheap and the earnings are actually going to be better there over the next 24 months. Exactly. Uh, you know, no one's looking at that right now. I think the perfect example, of Bobby, this is total Bobism. But, you know, it's not about if these are good or bad companies, but are they good or bad stocks? And I think Tesla is the poster child. We know Tesla's down over like 25% or so this year. Um, and last year, they delivered a record amount of cars, about 40% higher than the year before, which is awesome. That's a great company. I don't care what anybody says. They basically have changed the world when it comes to electric vehicles. The problem is that stock peaked over two years ago when the Ford price to earnings ratio was something like 150 times forward earnings. So the point is, all the good news and all the good things that are happening with Tesla today were priced in a long time ago. And that's exactly what's going to happen with all these other stocks that have huge valuations right now. It's all getting priced in today. So those companies can continue to do great things, but the stock market is already pricing it in, which means it's time to sell, not to buy. Wait a minute, right? Um, the stock hasn't moved in three years. Uh, that happened with Merck a couple of years ago, but you enjoyed a 3.85% dividend. Oh, that's right. Tesla doesn't pay a dividend. So you're not even, you're, all you're doing is sitting there watching dead money become more dead, right? Um, yeah, dividends are huge. There's nothing better than, than having a check come in and you have a, you know, you, you got a whole smorgasbord of great opportunities to invest your money. Well, it's like you can watch the stock go down, but you can use those dollars and dividends to wipe your tears. <laughs> well, I think also just looking ahead here, you know, the other narrative that you're hearing a lot about right now is what's the consumer going to do this year? You know, mm -hmm. Consumer retail spending wasn't as great this past month. And, you know, there's one thing I, I love is Wall Street's always dour on U.S. consumer. They're always ready for the U.S. consumer to pull back, but Americans love to spend money. <laughs> and- I think if you look out into the future, you look out into this year, I think what's hard to really understand is you, you had about two years there where inflation was beating out wages. We call that stagflation. Mm -hmm. And everyone kind of looked at the past and says, well, that's a big problem. But if you look at since last March, inflation has been slower than wage growth. And that's a great place to be. When wages are growing over your inflation or cost of living, it's kind of like you got to skate where the puck is going. We're probably going to see more of that over the next couple of months, which means the purchasing power for the consumer is probably going to be pretty good this year. Another reason we should have a pretty good economy this year, but you're not hearing that narrative anywhere. Well, you know, I'll tell you what, these uh, economists remind me of my buddies from college. They're really lazy. You know, they just they just look at one number and they and don't look past that one number. And, you know, right now we just had, you know, net interest uh, income received, you know, personal income. It's an all-time record high, $1.8 trillion, guys. 
And, you know, the economists are like, oh, well, you know, the consumer's running out of spending. You know, they're, 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 they're saving. So the saving rate's down. Um, well, you know, they don't realize that, you know, labor market's tight. Job openings are rising. Hourly wages are going up. And, and the baby boomers have a lot of excess income, you know, to spend, right? $75 trillion. So it's, you know, they kind of miss that whole point and they get focused on the wrong number. Uh, so, you know, I think that that's, you know, when you're in a big booming bull market, the surprises come on the upside. And that seems to be the case, you know, since we bottomed here in October of 2022. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 149, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. Bob, Chris, and I have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you. But if you want a more hands-on approach, want a second opinion on your financial plan, and you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence, Bob, Chris, and I will run for your total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you your own income plan, build your own personalized financial portal to give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every issue you need to address today. How to take Social Security, how to draw from your portfolio, building that dynamic income plan to make sure that you're financially protected. We're going to look at diversification. Markets have been all over the place, crazy volatile the last two, three years. Has your portfolio been all over the place as well? Or have you been sitting in cash with too much cash? Paralysis by analysis. We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll pit it against what you're doing now, show you how to grow your wealth, tie it to your goals. But most importantly, we'll show you how to protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost on your portfolio and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan if you saved over a million dollars to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. That's P-A-Y-N-E, of course. Uh, that's having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, so I thought we could revisit a topic that we you know, we typically talk about once in a while on the show, and that's this whole idea of being the financial red zone. You know, Ryan, I think we could probably uh, copy, copyright this or trademark this because, you know, after we did the first financial red zone podcast, every time I meet with a client that's in within five to 10 years of retirement, they always bring it up. They always want to know if they're in the financial red zone. <laughs> well, you know, Chris, that's a great question to ask. And, and that's, you know, it goes shows that your clients are well planned. But, you know, just like my favorite football team that can't seem to score in the red zone, you know, there are a lot of people out there that snatch, you know, defeat out of the jaws of victory because they make some really dumb decisions right as they're about to enter the financial red zone. Yeah. And I think it's crazy to think, but like by the time you hit 50, you really want to start thinking about what's it going to look like for me to live off my portfolio. That paycheck someday is going to stop. Um, and how do I get there from here? And the earlier you get look, your planning or the earlier you start looking at that, the much easier it is, the closer and closer you get to that financial independence or retirement date. Yeah. And, you know, one of the one of the big things that I find, you know, as, as we do, you know, however many plans we do a year, a thousand plans or so a year is just getting a good handle on what your expenses are. Um, you know, just really taking a hard look at everything that comes in, every dollar in, every dollar out. I find that's the biggest risk uh, with my clients. So who do you think is, is harder to plan for? Um, an entrepreneur, corporate executive that owns the business, or, you know, someone who has a fixed salary, you know, with a inflationary increase. So they, they know, they know exactly how much money is going to come in versus an entrepreneur can say, well, you know, if I'm a little short, I'll go out and I'll, I'll sell another car. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, lease another building. I mean, who do you think are, are the most difficult? Yeah, you know, I think, I think entrepreneurs do have an edge there because they're used to uncertainty, but in, in all fairness, I think it's scary for anybody, but if you're used to getting a paycheck every month, you're used to having uh, you know, money come in on a consistent basis in the same amount. Yeah, I think retirement has become a little more daunting, right? Because yeah. you're kind of used to things being very systematic uh, and very normalized. And you don't have to worry about, to your point, Bob, if you're an entrepreneur, a lot of times, maybe uh, there's no money coming in. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think, but I think the problem is for both. If you're an entrepreneur, maybe you're inclined to take too much risk. 
Um, and if maybe on the other hand, you work for a company, you had a more, um, let's call it consistent salary, you might not be taking enough risk for retirement. So I think, you know, somewhere in the middle, you got to find that right balance for you. And it's different for everybody, but some people want to take too much risk and some of you don't want to take enough risk to get to your goals. Yeah, you know, I think it comes down to, you know, one of my favorite Bobisms, right? People project the future based on their most recent experience. So you know, if someone who's had a record year, you know, in their company or a record year in their position in marketing, and then they rebuild their, their lifestyle around having that record year forever, right? So you, we got to kind of, you know, hold their feet to the ground. Um, because they have these big plans, like suddenly, you know, I need to buy two beach houses and uh, maybe I'll buy three condos. Um, you know, that, uh, that prop plane doesn't look as fast as that jet that I, you know, my buddy has. So, you know, I think it's, it's really amazing how, you know, planning, it's not just not garbage in numbers in numbers out. It's, it's really, you gotta, you you gotta be sort of a, a, you know, amateur psychiatrist, you know, to, to get people to think properly. Well, well, two points on that. Chris definitely bought a new boat last year, so it sounds like his income went up, yep. I suspect. <laughs> um, but but secondly, I think that's really critical when you're in the financial red zone is a lot of times that's when you're peak financial earning years. That's where you have to be the most diligent about saving yep. because you don't have that much time left. And typically when you get into your late 40s, early 50s, that's when you start making probably some of the biggest money you're going to make in your career. Yep. You can't let that opportunity pass. You've got to put some of that money away. Well, you know, well, that's a really good point, Ryan. I was actually talking to a client of mine recently, um, and he was under the impression that he could live on, you know, forty thousand dollars a year. I said, "Well, that was your retirement plan of fifteen years ago." I said, "But you know, you've made a lot more money since then." And we went back and looked at his expenses, and uh, turns out his expenses were like double that. So you need a client who's honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it tells you. It's like trying to invest in Enron stock with the executives giving you false earnings information. They stuck at end well, but I think the other thing. Um, and I, and, and this is something I taught you guys when you were young, uh, cause you know, my parents' generation is like, oh, go work for a big company. You know, you'll get your 40 years in and you get your gold watch and your pension and you're set for life. And, and to me, that's just a gilded cage, right? So it's, it was always, you know, you, you want to be thinking outside the box. You want to have control over your income. And I think a way of <clears throat> looking at that, when you do a financial plan, just don't look at, you know, how much wealth you're going to have. Look at your income. How much income is it going to generate? Net of inflation, net of taxation, and you want a financial planner who tortures you. you know, <laughs> wants to make it the worst case scenario, right? Because if the worst case scenario makes it, then you got close to a 98, 99 percent uh, chance of that of that plan being successful. Yeah, and I think sometimes it feels like, well, that's so far away. I'm 10 years away from retirement. I'm 15 years away. But the sooner that you start putting numbers around what you think you're going to need, it's going to change over the next 10, 15 years. But the sooner you start thinking about it, the planning becomes much easier because then you're just tweaking things along the way. What I found is when we start planning earlier, a lot of times you're ahead of schedule. You know, maybe you thought, I want to be financially independent at age 65, but maybe you get there at 60. And that's great flexibility and optionality, right? If you get there earlier, because then it's like, well, then you work because you want to work, not because you have to. And if you want to get out early from your career, you could do it. That's like a great place to be, right? You have kind of like everything, the wind's at your back, I guess is a better way of putting it. And that just comes with start running those numbers early. It's never too early to start putting numbers around what do you want to be financially independent? What dollar amount you might need? What income streams are you going to have coming in? The earlier you do that, it's just like, we, and we know this from experience because we're with a lot of clients in their 30s and 40s as well. Um, is it just makes life so much easier down the line with your financial planning. Well, that's a hard part for me. I'm trying to explain to your mother, you know, like uh, we've been in the financial red zone now for 20 years. And every five years, if you guys run my projections, the goalposts move. And I'm like, you know, I mean, how how freaking long is this this red zone? I seem to be in it forever. I think Bob's lifestyle goes up uh, significantly every year, Chris. <laughs> but, Dad, you know, we, we, did, we did find that pension that you have now. You didn't realize you had a pension. It's true. You know, it's, it's the only thing that's missing is the gold watch. Yeah, they never gave me a gold watch. You know, I'm really upset about that. So, uh, you know, we got I budget constraints here, paying capital, so you can get a. Uh, we'll get you a nice plastic watch. <laughs> but I'll tell you, Washington's going to go crazy in the next couple of years. I just saw Washington State just instituted a seven percent surtax on capital gains. Um, this is above their state income tax. So, for anybody who makes a a sale of over two hundred fifty thousand, so. Bezos, you know, the CEO and founder of Amazon, moved to Miami, 
so he could sell $2 billion worth of Amazon stock. That saved him $600 million, right? I mean, you could probably buy a nice sweet condo on Miami Beach with $600 million, don't you think, guys? Yeah, but I mean, it's like, you know, you, you, you see that too. Like the state of California, the same thing's happening. It's like, you know, people are, people are going to leave um, the states that are not as tax advantageous. I mean, it just makes a lot of sense. And that's all part of the, it's all part of the financial picture. Yeah, it is, Chris, but that's where the planning comes in, you know, to look for what's the most tax efficient way to, you know, to accumulate and grow my wealth. And, um, and then at the same time, you know, we just had a gigantic inflationary spike. Um, those prices are not going down. Uh, they're just going up less slowly, but you've got to factor those in. And then you start to look at, how long the baby boomers are, are, are living, you really got to look at those health care costs, you know, when you're in your 80s and 90s. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, American federal, state, and local borrowing will hit 127% of GDP this year, according to the IMF forecast, or 100% when debt owned by parts of government are netted out, compared to the euro area or eurozone uh, that had a debt meltdown about a decade ago, um, they actually only have debt to GDP of like 88% or a net 74%. So we're way more leveraged than Europe right now. That's kind of wild. No, it really is. And um, you know, these governments are seemingly out of control. Um but, you know, the, the U.S. has a lot of assets, right? And there's a lot of different ways, you know, that they can eliminate this debt, you know, one of which will be to inflate their way out of it. Um, but I think we're going to get to a point where the American public is going to start to push back and we'll start to see some solutions. I like that. Uh, as long as the bond market's not concerned about it, I'm not concerned about it, but it, it's certainly one of those bricks in my wall of worry that we are continuing to grow now as uh, time passes. Yeah, definitely something uh, we got to keep an eye on. Could be a bigger problem down the line. Chris, the new construction in the U.S. is currently running at about 1.4 million units at an annual rate, close to growth in underlying demographic demand, but still far short of what's needed to reduce the shortfall. That's why housing construction stopped falling in 2023, even with really high interest rates. Uh, and I think you know, the bottom line here is we still have a housing shortage even with them starting to build more. Well, I'll tell you what, that's really telling. I uh, went down to Florida to visit uh, mom and dad, and we went out to the Everglades. And, you know, the Everglades, you think of just, you know, vast expanses of swampland, but it's really vast expanses of new gated communities. So, you know, everywhere I turn around, there's uh, some kind of new construction project going up for housing. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and if you look at the Home Builder Index last year, it actually trounced technology. It was up 60%. So, uh, you know, housing clearly is a serious issue here in the U.S., and it's not solved yet. All right, Bob, Microsoft has 53,000 Azure AI customers, and over a third of them are now new to Azure over the past 12 months, according to CEO Satya Nadella. More than half of the Fortune 500 use Azure OpenAI, including Ally Financial, Coca-Cola, Rockwell Automation, according to uh, his transcript from the last quarterly earnings call. Well, I think it's wonderful that we have a new technology that everyone is embracing and it will benefit, you know, every single company. And you don't have to pinpoint, you know, which company that's going to be. You know, you don't have to own Microsoft or NVIDIA or advanced micro devices or even Amazon because every company is going to get a productivity increase. And, you know, productivity is like that pixie dust, guys. You know, you spread it on every balance sheet and every company and magical things start to happen. So I'm looking for margins. To, to broaden, I'm looking for productivity to go up. I'm looking for the roaring 2020s here, pal. You heard it here first. Bob Payne's calling from the roaring 2020s. Don't forget it. Another great show, gentlemen. As always, if you like our podcast, love our podcast, please subscribe on iTunes. Give us that five-star rating. And please leave some comments so let people know how wonderful our podcast is. If it's on Spotify, you can subscribe to our channel. And if it's on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to the channel. Click that notification bell so you get updated every week of our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.